Hi, so today I'm talking again to George Posner from uh, Alnovo, the founder of Alnovo. Uh, George, it's been ages since we last spoke, uh, so maybe you could just update us a bit on what you've been up to in the last year or so, I guess. It's, uh, it's certainly been too long, Jonathan, uh, but where uh, we're at at present, Alnovo uh, started back in uh, late 2005. Uh, and we uh, started knowing that we would essentially, well, the goal is to force demand, uh, purchasing uh, uh, consumer professional procurement uh, with uh, trusted data about corporate behavior uh, such that uh, the demand can start operating in a more intelligent or evolved way. Uh, and we could essentially help create affinity with companies that are doing the right thing. Uh, and uh, we knew at the very beginning we needed to have trusted. Uh, uh, and so we, uh, we went out and acquired, uh, based upon a license deal, data from KLD Research and Analytics. Uh, over the course of the last uh, uh, several years since we were founded, uh, KLD was purchased, uh, and then uh, the company that purchased all, uh, KLD was was purchased, uh, and that created some challenges with respect to uh, gaining access. To We've continued to have discussions with uh, some data agencies, uh, however. We feel in terms of mitigating our own risk, uh, at present, we're looking uh, to uh, aggregate and normalize data that's readily available, uh, whether it be trusted governmental data, uh, NGO data, uh, and, uh, and basically produce uh, our, own, uh, our own information. Uh, uh, other uh, entities that are operating uh, here in America and around the world, uh, or whether we're doing it ourselves, we, we feel that that is where our focus needs to be as establishing a strong foundation for uh, our, our objective, which is to, to basically inform, in a trusted way, market. Okay. So, so it sounds like you're um, kind of broadening the, the range of data sources then with, with Alnovo. Um, can you tell us a, a bit about uh, Suspect, the issues? Not necessarily, you, hmm? not, not necessarily broadening uh, because uh, we, we would not, uh, at least initially, we certainly wouldn't have the resources necessary to conduct uh, the, uh, the, the research ourselves. Uh, it's really the, uh, the acquisition, the identification, acquisition, uh, and normalization and aggregation of existing data. So identifying what's trusted, making sure that it's attributed uh, to consumers or procurement individuals uh, want to understand why a particular company has a grade that they do. They can see that, that the grade is, made, is predicated upon uh, data coming from source A. Uh, so that's uh, not necessarily broadening, but uh, but uh, uh, really uh, trying to assemble from the various sources available a trusted uh, a trusted set of information. Mm. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about you know how that process is working for you? How you actually collaborate with these other organisations um, and. Uh, kind of some of the issues that, that arise from from that collaboration. Well, we're we're still in uh, as as you know, and uh, the the identification of trusted streams uh, in and of itself is is a very challenging, resource intensive uh, uh, work. We've we've gone out and and fits uh, as well as some for profit entities in this area. To uh, to low opportunities to collaborate, uh, I'm I'm a strong believer in in doing things in a very open and transparent way, and the fact that we're structured as a nonprofit I think helps us do that as opposed to a, a for-profit entity, uh, and so 
the biggest challenge that we face in collaboration is uh, because we are uh, very early stage and are probably don't have the resources to uh, to acquire. We we must uh, negotiate uh, with other entities with respect to back end uh, and. Um, because of the state of, I think, the world economy at this point, uh, people are really looking for uh, cash and resource right away. They're not looking for back end or, uh, you know, when something great happens 18 months from now, uh, they'll, they'll be able to uh, uh, enjoy some of the revenue. I think, Jonathan, uh, a barrier to collaboration. Uh, I know that back when we founded, uh, many companies were far far more interested. They were very supportive of the concept and more willing to uh, operate on a back-end type deal. Uh, and so the other thing that I'm continuing to think of, uh, and this, this goes back to, I think, when we initially had some of our uh, conference calls uh, among that, that you and uh, Ansley had put together, which were wonderful, uh, our thought uh, approach uh, monetization, how we can uh, essentially do revenue sharing to uh, to really foster uh, collaboration uh, and cooperation among uh, different entities. And so I, I do give a lot of thought to that about different ways that we can create uh, additional visits work uh, and ways and uh, ways in which we can be viable and yet share, uh, in a revenue stream that comes from basically connecting uh, consumers and, and market force demand and uh, investors with companies that are doing the right thing. Mm, right, yeah. yeah. I think a lot of what you're talking about with you know, limitations on resources and um, a difficulty of finding finance and, and revenue in, in this current economic climate is probably something that, that all the projects are, are facing and grappling with. and. Um, it's interesting to think about, I guess, perhaps in the context of, of the data quality you were talking about. I was just talking to Alice Jones in my last interview, and he was saying, as I think you just mentioned, um, that a lot of the data is now coming from for-profit companies and from kind of more business-minded um, think tanks that maybe have uh, some hidden interests there, maybe not as unbiased as some of the non-profit organizations like yourself. Um, I was just wondering, kind of in, in that context, if you got any ideas about um, how those challenges can be kind of uh, can be addressed within the constraints of the limited resources that, that you talk about. I I think that um, you really there, obviously there are two ways to deal with it. One is uh, you deal with it uh, as each entity uh, uh, or each project in this area continues to evolve and mature, uh, then uh, ways become uh, apparent uh, in which uh, we can effectively share uh, revenue and help each other uh, become viable uh, upon individual donations, our own self-funding uh, or a foundation grant less beholden to anyone uh, uh, other than essentially providing uh, the, the most uh, the, the data with, with great integrity, uh, which is in my mind always a concern with a for-profit entity because even, uh, even if a for-profit starts out very well intentioned, uh, there are no guarantee uh, or the uh, executive officers will remain intact uh, and we've seen that uh, with and an, I won't mention any names but we've seen some great uh, efforts launch that have received multiple rounds of venture capital funding and whose management teams have now largely been replaced and so uh, the last thing that any of us should accept uh, is uh, an, a ratings agency or entity that's in influencing uh, led by uh, a bunch of uh, Exxon Mobil, Dow Chemical, and Walmart executives, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, and so. Anyways, 
the other way, Jonathan, I think is is really by in the very early stage by design, and and I think that that's more challenging, but could effectively be uh, what what how we really need to approach. Uh, uh, viability uh, uh, and to make sure that each of our product uh, projects remain viable essentially uh, doing doing things or, or designing uh, monetization and revenue sharing uh, into the very beginning of our projects um, and that's something that's that's a, a little more challenging in the respect that we tend to be very focused on what our end product needs to be, and I I, I fully understand that that there uh, there are are a lot of moving what we're all uh, attempting, uh, but obviously the end the end state uh, if we're unable to get to the end state, and so I think that there really needs to be uh, some a, a bit of time spent with. Uh, here's where we're going, uh, here's what we want to do, uh, what are the monetization opportunities within each of our designs, and how can we best share revenue. So, for example, uh, if I uh, decide G Project X is doing some wonderful things with data that we would love to leverage, uh, uh, perhaps we uh, we're using some of the Project X data, and every time uh, a consumer uh, or institutional procurement uh, individual uh, looks at that data through our lens, uh, there's some sort of tip jar, some share, whatever monetization opportunities out of that uh, out of that transaction uh, with Project X, and ultimately, I think that helps all of us focus on our core work um, while we uh, that there is uh, a, uh, a, uh, a playing field in this area that is uh, uh, maturing, evolving, and has the resources that we need to do so. Yeah. Okay. So, so in terms of the organizations that are creating this data and, and doing the research, then uh, perhaps you know, this paper use idea is very interesting. Have you got any ideas um, for those organizations um, that are consumer facing? Um, you, you mentioned that, that obviously so, it's, in, it's important to, to know where the money is coming from, but have you got any ideas about how those organizations could do it in an ethical way, could ethically generate revenue for themselves? That's um, the, the, so for for entities that are directly customer facing, part of what some of our uh, thoughts are, uh, are, are essentially, I mean, there are two ways you can generate revenue uh, outside, of, uh, outside of donations. The foundation everybody really wants to rely on. I think that initially in your early development, that, that is important. Uh, but we would all like to be viable without having to uh, go back and write grants and uh, depend upon uh, uh, different foundations and, and individuals for our work. Uh, <clears throat> and so the two methods really to generate revenue are either on advertising, which of course for all of us is, is a bit dangerous, uh, or uh, a, a, a piece of a beach. So for example, uh, if if uh, a is trying to understand, based upon their values, uh, should I buy product uh, a product from company X or a similar product from company Y, uh, if they complete the transaction based upon the data that we've provided, then we receive a, a small piece of that transaction. Both advertising and commerce uh, are can be very dangerous if they're not done in a completely transparent way way. Uh, we initially started out thinking about uh, revenue uh, as part of each transaction uh, moving through the system. Uh, we've since, uh, uh, in, in terms of our own model, and because we, we really would like to serve, uh, and we would like to serve the suppliers uh, and that are really evolved, uh, we uh, went through uh, very select advertising, 
And so what, what we, uh, the direction that we're looking at, and, and I've had a lot of good uh, and spirited discussions with people that, that have said, you know, gee, why not advertising from Walmart? Why not advertising from these other companies? Uh, but what we're, what we're looking to do is to perhaps take uh, the, most, the most ethical companies and allow them to effectively advertise uh, on our site. Uh, in the U.S., there's a company, um, uh, I believe, called uh, Brilliant. Um, boy, I can't, I, the, name, the name escapes me right now. But they're essentially a diamond uh, company, a diamond uh, business. Uh, and they uh, certify their dining uh, as fair trade on uh, non-blood diamonds. Uh, and so allowing entities like that that are operating in a more evolved way to advertise uh, not only help make the affinity or connection between consumer and companies that are doing the right thing, but we also are able to generate revenue and we're able to help those companies develop and, and gain more visibility uh, with uh, a more aware consumer base. And so, it, to me, it's a very valuable uh, uh, advertising uh, piece that we can do. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so, but again, it has to be transparent and we have to be very careful. An example, an, an example of, is uh, seventh generation uh, uh Seventh Generation and, and the work of Jeff Hollander, which I, I have great respect for. Well, Jeff uh, uh, was a replaced CEO uh, by a large company that came in. Uh, and so when you see things like that, it's possible for companies that, that are more evolved uh, to essentially move in different directions. Uh, and then, again, it just goes back to transparency, Jonathan. We need to make sure that we react to things things and we educate continue to educate consumers uh, and um, and are very transparent about um, about what our objectives are and where the advertising dollars are coming from okay um, I was just wondering if you'd seen uh, any examples um, from maybe not necessarily from within this domain but that uh, struck you of um, of communities uh, working around this this kind of data. Obviously, you're talking about a kind of, in some ways, a, an organism of, of different entities, nonprofits, and and so forth. But is there potential? Do you think for for a broader kind of community of people to get involved in in this process? I think to be successful, based upon the road ahead, uh, because uh, initially we were interested in covering. Uh, uh, three to five thousand of the, the largest of the largest companies. Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg. I believe that there there is a uh, there are transitional states of what what it is that we're attempting to do, uh, and I think that a very important part of the uh, of of a transitional phase is with a community, a large community of people. The, the challenge with a large open community of people providing data uh, or weighing in uh, is it how we don't road truck uh, the opportunity to operate in a, in a very unethical way uh, to influence uh, uh, influence community opinion uh, can be very dangerous uh, and so uh, I think community is important. But I've always believed that there is a, a there is a trust hierarchy of data in which community is different from uh, essentially uh, socially responsible investment research and analysis data, uh, which I think is held to a much higher standard. It tends to be very proprietary. Uh, I think that as when I think about what we're doing as being in a transitional state. Uh, I believe that eventually uh, all companies uh, or most companies that want to essentially achieve uh, some sort of ethical uh, ability or awareness will essentially release data through their financial reports that are uh, auditable and objective uh, mathematically 
objective I mean, for as a community can use to then rate uh, uh, various companies against their pe industry peers as well as against overall the overall industry. So, for example, uh, if ExxonMobil says they're turning green uh, and that 90% of their purchases are now uh, predicated upon uh, certain social standards, that we have an auditable way to understand that and check that, that it's not the community uh, simply weighing in about their perspective of Exxon math to, uh, to essentially uh, then distill and provide back to consumers and procurement officers uh, in a very easy to understand accessible way. Mm -hmm. But there's a transition state. Community is going to be very important. I think trust issues, uh, uh, dealing with the trust issues with the community are, are vital uh, and that um, that that, that it is a transition to what I hope to be uh, really a, maybe in 10 or 15 years. Okay. So uh, that sounds like um, a vision of, of the future that I think uh, a lot of us would want, certainly with um, companies providing a lot more transparency than they do at present. Have you got any ideas about um, the steps that that you think maybe need to happen before we before we reach that state. I think that uh, that essentially the a uh, international agreement on what are the, the essentially the neighbors. I mean that it will evolve. That it will be essentially a work in progress. But uh, a an agreement with respect to here are the data attributes. Uh, that we believe are the most significant in understanding uh, the behavior of a company uh, and, uh, and then essentially understanding the ways uh, the applications, the ERP systems, uh, and the financial systems of, of companies, uh, understanding where that data can be made available. Uh, some of it can be readily available right now. For example, if we're, if we're testing for executive compensation, uh, that data is essentially available uh, within, within uh, enterprise systems at this point in time. Uh, it's just a question of making that data accessible. A data roadmap, uh, and in some respects, I think companies would like that too from a directional standpoint because if you talk to uh, a lot of social responsibility officers at various companies, uh, they'll, they'll still tell you that they have survey fatigue, that they get uh, a survey from uh, Amnesty International and they get a survey from uh, on, on maybe the, the World Wildlife uh, Fund and, and uh, 50 other surveys from, uh, from well-intended and need to come together uh, and, and say, you know, here are the 21 attributes that we want to understand uh, and to essentially agree. And, and I know that the, uh, um, the GRI is, has uh, certainly done a lot of great work in this area, but I think that we need to make sure that we have agreement and that we can take it a step farther. Uh, we have auditable information on uh, 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 because without without auditable want to report, then I will. I mean, if my uh, if my uh, objective is to generate as much profit as possible, uh, and I'm not held uh, to any kind of ethical uh, checking or validity, that's a that's a real problem. I mean, we can see that even even with companies. <laughs> And uh, and SE, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission reporting and uh, rather uh, rather uh, uh, innovative accounting mechanisms. We see that even with we have to we have to demand auditability, uh, and uh, we need to make sure that this data uh, is elevated uh, to be as important as as profitability reporting uh, uh, in it. Uh, in and out, mid-size and small companies. Uh, the, the work of uh, Michael Galobter, uh, who's here uh, close to me in the Bay Area, 
uh, has been working with a uh, small entity that actually serves a lot of small to mid-sized businesses. And he's been working on actually getting uh, some uh, environmental factors uh, uh, integrated into their, their accounting offering. And so I, I do see that there are uh, there is movement in this area to uh, help us get help us accelerate the transition to a pure math state. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting to to think about these issues uh, from within the businesses um, because it sounds like from what you're saying that there's um, potential for removing some barriers there that li literally kind of practical barriers about um, businesses being able to and making it easy for businesses to, to be more transparent. Uh, also, another thing that Ellis Jones was talking about was the need uh, for businesses to kind of make decisions about how much money they spend on communicating how green they are versus actually being green and making pro progress. Um, so obviously some companies favor the 100% greenwash approach and some perhaps are doing great things but don't have the resource to shout about it. I don't know if you have any views on, on how we might be able to help uh, businesses that are generally trying to do the right thing to, to get their message out, essentially. So it's interesting, Jonathan. There are two, there are two places when we, when we talk about struggling with our own resources, the two places where it absolutely makes sense that uh, where there should be a flood, should all be drowned. In thing to think about uh, is is from uh, companies that are evolving to do the right thing uh, because they do need to get the word out in a trusted way mm -hmm. and they can't compete with with an entity like Walmart that's that's pumping uh, or uh, the former Philip Morris and Altria uh, and some of their commercials that they're pumping money into uh, essentially jumping up and down uh, in front of society saying look we're different. We've changed, uh, and not these bad, bad people in the past. And then you have entities that are actually doing the right thing. And the problem is, if you self-promote, in either case, you're going to diminish what you're, what you're actively, what you're actively doing. And so, uh, the companies that are doing the right thing should be very, very supportive of all of us, uh, and and essentially making sure that the word can. get out in a trusted institutional procurement, uh, uh, they, they should be uh, really uh, moving to, to help support us uh, is the socially responsible investment space. Uh, for a long time, I've said that uh, the SRI community, uh, I, I want to turn uh, some of our most egregious uh, world citizens, uh, uh, I won't mention people like Dick Cheney by name, I guess. Uh, but we should take some of our, our most egregious world citizens and turn them into socially responsible investors. And the way that we do that is to essentially drive demand to companies that are doing the right thing. As we drive demand there, their equity value will rise. And there's nothing that's going to, uh, uh, even progressives, when I've, when I've talked to progressives about investment in money, uh, many Many of them, sadly, in companies doing the right thing, don't mind that you know a large part of their portfolio is in Exxon Mobil, and they'll write you know a thousand dollar check to Doctors Without Orders at the end of the good about themselves. And uh, I've even had discussions with uh, uh, some of the folks uh, at Microsoft Foundation. Uh, they had produced the document uh, about uh, socially responsible investing and how they felt gee, our, our job as a foundation is to get the highest return on investment. And I, I drafted a letter and said, aren't you concerned that some of your investment is perpetuating situations globally that then you're essentially providing grants to address? Unfortunately, I never got a response, and perhaps that was a response. Uh, but the, the SRI community should be making sure that all of our efforts are well, eventually, we're the people that are going to that are going to take the SRI community that 
They've been, they've been successful. They've had influence on the world stage uh, with respect to uh, their efforts in, uh, in eroding uh, and finally getting rid of apartheid and other issues. I've got a lot of respect for them, but they will always be somewhat marginalized if we don't address demand. Uh, and so we're, we're a very important part of the equation uh, that they're working on, but yet we've largely been uh, uh, left uh, uh, alone and uh, undercapitalized and under-resourced. And, and that's a situation where the SRI community really should be thinking about how can we, how can we essentially drive some of these efforts. They recognize the significance because KLD... And, and Steve Leidenberg and Amy Dominey. And of course, uh, Steve and Amy are, are Dominey Social Investments, uh, and KLD uh, was a ratings agency for a long time. So they do understand, the industry does understand the significance, but they're still allowing uh, the, uh, it, they're still, I think, fostering uh, segmentation. And, uh, and autonomy is a good thing, but I think that they should be stepping in with some capital. Sure, uh, a lot of the projects will, will agree with you there. Um, it's been a really interesting conversation. Thank you for your, for your time. I'm grateful, Jonathan. And, and uh, again, I'm looking forward to getting the, the group back together. I enjoyed those discussions and, and uh, looking forward to what the future holds for all of us. There's a, a lot of work out there, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure, yes. Thanks a lot.